This is episode number 163. Today we're featuring the amazing, maybe amazing is not even a strong enough word, the incredible Daniel Sprick. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plein Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plein Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plein Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, Jim Kipping, and welcome everybody to the Plein Air Podcast. My name is Eric Rhodes, and I am the publisher of Plein Air Magazine and a Plein Air Painter. And I don't know if you've been following my activities on Facebook or Instagram. If not, by the way, I hope you'll you'll follow me. It's just Eric Rhodes. But I've been in Russia for the last two weeks. I've been there doing three primary things, filming a new art instruction video with a famous Russian master, Nikolai Blokhin, which is going to be coming out soon. I'm also there working on a documentary, so I interviewed top art leaders in Russia, including the heads of two major art schools there, the Repin and the Sarikov, two of the best schools in the world. Also the director of the Tretikov Museum, the world-famous museum in Moscow, and uh, the director of the Hermitage, the great, one of the greatest, maybe the greatest museum in the world in St. Petersburg. And I also interviewed the famous Kugach family of artists, which is like our Wyeth family, and Nikolai Dubovik, the other Russian master that's a good friend of mine. I spent several days with him, and of course, several others. I also got a chance to paint there, and even though it's winter, I had to do it. I also went on a site selection. Nikolai Dubovik and I went in a car, and we drove up to these small villages, uh, incredible villages, very Russian, very romantic, some of them the old um, like log cabin-ish buildings, but and then the dashes and the and the monasteries, just really beautiful. Anyway, I'm preparing a trip to Russia for 50 people in September of 2021, and it's only going to be 50 people, and we're going to do St. Petersburg painting there, but also some tourism things because you got to see the Hermitage, you got to see the incredible Russian museum, and a couple other things. We're then going to go inland to two areas where there are lots of villages. Uh, places where Repin and Levitan and Shishkin and the other Russian greats painted. And we're also going to visit the top museums, and it's a painting trip. So mostly we're going to be painting, but you'll be hearing details about that coming up soon. And that's something that once I announce it, you're going to want to grab it because it's a rare opportunity, and it's totally safe. You're there with people that know the area. I've got people that are working with me that it, it's going to be fine. And of course, Russia is a very safe place anyway. You hear a lot of rumors, and there are, there are problems like there are any other cities, the big cities like Los Angeles or Chicago or something. But anyway, um, that's going to be coming up soon. This week, the 15th of March, we end our annual Plein Air Salon bi-monthly art competition. This is the last chance to enter for the year, and you'll have till midnight on the 15th to get your best paintings of the year in and get them judged. Anybody who wins in the bi-monthly round in any of 20 different categories is then going to be entered into the judging for the annual Plein Air Salon $15,000 prize and all the other prizes got a lot of prizes. And so get yours entered at pleinairsalon.com. I'm really excited about today's interview. I got to know Dan Sprick because of his amazing figurative work. As a matter of fact, I had him come and do a demo at our figurative art convention which this year is coming up in October. But I discovered he's also an amazing plein air painter. In fact, one of the finest plein air painters I've ever seen. Very different from everybody else's approach. Um, he uses a lot of uh, really thin paint and a lot of glazing techniques, and his values are spot on, and the, the depth and detail of his paintings are incredible, and yet they're not really detailed. It's, I can't explain it. You'd have to see them. When I saw him painting at last year's plein air convention, I walked up to him and I said, you need to be on the faculty next year. So he's going to be on the main stage. He's amazing. And uh, if you're going to the plein air convention, if you're one of the lucky ones that got a seat to it, uh, you're going to see him and you will 
not want to miss it. You will absolutely be amazed. Anyway, he's our interview today. Coming up after the interview, I'm going to be answering some art marketing questions in the Art Marketing Minute. And I should also remind you, the Art Marketing Minute is now its own podcast. And if you have friends that are not plein air painters that don't want to listen to the plein air podcast, but they need marketing ideas, well, send them to Art Marketing Podcast and they can find it on iTunes or their favorite podcast place. Well, let's get right to the meat, right to the interview with the incredible Daniel Sprick. Daniel Sprick, welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. Thank you, Eric. I wasn't sure you were there. <laughs> I was expecting to hear from you. So um, for, for the benefit of everybody who might be listening, um, you know, I, I think that you're very, very well known, I guess probably famous, as a, a figurative painter and, and for your narrative scenes, but I don't know that you're as well known as a plein air painter um, because uh, that's part of you we don't see a lot of. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I kind of am curious how, how this plein air thing started, which was it chicken or egg, which started first? Well, the first painting I was even doing when I was young was outside. Uh, and uh, it, it made a lot of sense because I didn't have a studio. So if, if you don't have a studio, you got to paint wherever you're at. And outside was was my studio. And uh, uh, although uh, the the outdoor paintings I was doing then, uh, I would say were r really not very good at all. But it's uh, you, you know everybody has to start somewhere and. Um, uh, it's been a really long, slow process for me, and it's I've found outdoor painting and landscape painting to be the most difficult of all subjects. Really, the why most is that? Challenging. Is it because there's so many different pieces of form that you have to render, or is it what? What is it exactly? You know, there's that of what you just said. And there's, uh, it, it's kind of a, a, a boundless subject, literally. And you can, you know, you get a little framing mechanism and decide which part to make your painting of. And I was shown how to do that at an early age. But it still is like taking on the universe. And here's a, another thing about it that... Um, <sighs> It seems to be quite a bit different than working in a contained space, such as a still life, or as a um, even as a figure, a portrait. And what's different is the the local colors are quite a bit different in landscape, and they're affected by different things. Like you may be painting a building, but it's the color of it's really affected by the sky, even if the sky's not in it in the picture. And and uh, another aspect is that, say, with, with still life and with uh, portraits, it's essentially, it can be reduced to a geometric object, but the sky can't. Right. I mean, maybe cumulus, cumulus clouds can, a few things can, but uh, it's, it's subject to different aspects that uh, I've just always found much more difficult to uh, uh, understand uh, what's going on, and then how to translate that into uh, two dimensions. So when you when you started doing this as a kid, like what age were you? Uh, I'd say about twenty. About yeah. twenty. And and, had and, you, and then, go ahead. Oh, I, I got my first. I was kind of, uh, a, you know, at sea. Or, wandering in the wilderness uh, until I got some good instruction when, when I was about 22. That was my next question. So who, who taught you? Well, the first really memorable, effective instructor was a, a guy in, um, who set up a one-month summer school in uh, Cloudcroft, New Mexico. And uh, in the early 70s was when I met him. And his name uh, was uh, Raymond Froman. And he, um, 
uh, painted kind of in the style of uh, John Singer Sargent. Uh-huh. Uh, a, a big uh, guiding influence on him also was uh, the illustrator Andy Loomis. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, who uh, I've, you know, in subsequent years gotten all those Andrew Loomis books, and they're really pretty darn helpful. There's yeah, they really are. Uh, you know, I, when I was at yeah. your studio, you, I noticed that you had them up on your shelf. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, it has occurred to me to, uh, even though his drawing was really excellent, uh, to uh, kind of make my own instruction book modeled on that, but supplying my own drawings. Uh, 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 but, of course, uh, that's, that's, uh, that would take years to do. Well, why don't you and, get uh, why don't you not, get started now, and I'll publish it, mm-hmm. and then and then uh, uh, <laughs> it gives you something to strive for. Because I know you don't you don't have anything else to do. There's nothing else to do. That's the problem. You know, I'm just uh, <laughs> sitting here looking for something. Yeah, yeah I I would like to, but uh, you know, I I would like to, but there are really good quality instructional books around, lots of them, uh, and uh, essentially, if I it, it was just a remote pipe dream to do that uh, with Andy Loomis. Essentially, I'd, I'd basically copy his book, only only do my own drawings. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, make no secret of uh, the source material. Yeah. But it, it's, uh, it's just way, it, it, would, it would take, it would be way too much work. Yeah. Well, and and it really, his, his, his drawings are really good. It's a, it's, there's a, honestly, to be, I would I just maybe there's just a little taste difference, but it, it's drawings are really accurate and everything's in the right place. And they're just very commercial, which was he made no bones about it. Uh, you know, commercial. Well, he was he was an illustrator. Commercial artist. Yeah, yeah. I think his drawings are really better than his paintings. Those they're, uh, they're, those, uh, those books have just been republished recently, so they're really good. Huh? I, I got one for Christmas. Really good. So you neat. Um, you, you know, one of the things that, that we hear from time to time from some people is that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm painting. I don't really need to learn to draw. Uh, what would you say to that? Oh, man. Uh, well, in a practical way, the way I address that is that in my teaching, uh, most of the teaching I've ever done has been drawing because uh, it's futile to paint without without having a really solid understanding of drawing. And uh, I found that uh, I attracted uh, a, a more serious and more interesting students for drawing classes than for painting classes. And uh, so that was a pretty good reason. And I, I did it because uh, it allowed me to strengthen my own drawing. I, I taught it for uh, about 20 years at... Uh, Colorado Mountain College in Glenwood Springs Community College, um, you know, continuing education. And probably most of the people in my classes already long had their university degrees. They were just, you know, there to learn. And I had a really good group, and it usually boiled down to uh, maybe three or four people who would persistently, consistently come to the class. And so that allowed me to get my own work done. And I, I drew there um, one, sometimes two nights a week uh, for about a 20 year period. And then um, some of the, you know, the best artists in the group, um, I asked them to take it over for me. So, and essentially what would happen is I'd, I'd continue to go and draw and uh, to do the, hard work of instructing or, or, you know, I'd draw and uh, say Andrea Camp or Dean Bowlby would, um, you know, talk to the um, other artists there and explain to them what I was doing. So, I could, cause I tell you, it's very hard to work and talk at the same time. Yeah. I, 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 re- I just, I really can't. It, it, it takes your full attention. And if they, a, a frequent question is, do you listen to music or podcasts? And I'll listen a little bit, but I can't for long. And it, it will depend upon um, what part of the painting that I have in progress. So, because some parts of painting are 
you know, don't really require that much concentration, some parts, uh, uh, but uh, much of it really does. So and, which, and which, parts, of, which parts don't require concentration in your mind? Darn it. Uh, I was afraid you were going to ask that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, um, I'd say, uh, like, if, if you have, okay, one example would be uh, that when I've painted uh, Persian rugs, and they're not easy at all. Uh, but uh, once you have the drawing and pattern kind of laid out, um, then the you know painting individual knots is very repetitious. Yeah. And it's uh, it's you kind of have the the big problem solved, and uh, then it's it, it there is quite a quite a prolonged period of of rather tedious work to put them in, which um, I, and when I'm doing it. I just have to remind myself that, okay, I'm going to think later, I'm going to think this was worth it. <laughs> but uh, at the time, it, it can be, you know, kind of a, an, an endurance test. So uh, during uh, that would be one example of something that doesn't, at that point in the piece, and the drawing problems are pretty much solved, um, then you could free your mind to listen to a podcast or uh chat with somebody else in the room or something like that. Right. But um, by the way, uh, to, 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 uh, I w this is really kind of a sidestep into a technical area, but uh, a subject like, a, say, um, an oriental rug, if you don't mind me going into some technical stuff really quick. No, that'd be great. Uh, well, it's a little bit of a segue, but, and then I want to get back to, painting on location, outdoor painting on, and things like that. But about that, what a, a, a way that I go about it is, is to um, say, say the, say um, a Caucasian Kula Kazakh is, is, has, you know, predominant, you know, reds, blues, ivory colors and browns, but it's a, the rug is kind of going from light to shadow. Well, what I will do is I'll paint all the reds, all the browns, all the blues, just the same same mixture. I'll mix the colors on the palette and paint the exact, you know, all those knots. Right. So the the rug it's it's a, it requires a certain delayed gratification because the in painting when, while I'm painting it, it's obviously wrong. It's just flat, dead, terribly wrong, in the sense that um, there's no gradation of value. But uh, what I, I do is use a fast drying paint for that part, and then the next day I could glaze the shadows onto it. So it's um, it's essentially uh, breaking a problem down into component parts, and um, the result is it comes out you know component parts and solve one part at a time, uh, instead of you know beating yourself up to try to do it everything at once and um, it, 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 there's two effects which I've leads to another pattern but um, what I find is that it's not only faster and easier but mo more importantly the um, final outcome the quality is so much better than any other way I could do it so how does and that I, I have, how do you how do you translate that to let's say to plein air work are you doing a lot of glazing when you're out there in the field or no you no really. uh, no you can't because uh, it's um uh, because uh, usually i'm just out there for one day you know three hours five hours i'll certainly be out there long after the light has changed but um i usually don't come back but some sometimes sometimes it just depends on uh, you know, logistics, um, what the need is. I'll keep working on the piece after I get home, sometimes with, you know, a photo on my phone or usually without. Uh, and and not not on account of virtue, but on account of the, the problems I'm trying to resolve wouldn't be in it wouldn't be able to solve the photo. It's because that uh, they're compositional problems and, you know, um, 
unity of color and value and things like that. Or those are the really kinds of problems I'm trying to solve. And I will want to do um, a video together where uh, I would like to sh explain some ways of going about painting on location, or and not just explain, but demonstrate. Um, sorry, I'm jumping around all over the place. But uh, I do have an approach to it that I think is really pretty effective. And the, uh, one reason why it can be done pretty, uh, quite a detailed piece without, without the use of photos on location is to um, get the essence of it very quickly. You know, uh, knowing that the light's going to change, uh, you know, dramatically before you can finish because the light, well, you know, a sunny day, the light doesn't stay the same, you know, for long at all. It keeps changing. But you it just, you can put down the basic compositional elements uh, very quickly, the big shapes. And then but the details of, say, uh, you know, branches of a tree or shingles on a roof, uh, whatever the subject is, um, yeah, those details that, you know, they're going to basically stay in the same place. The drawing will stay, you know, fundamentally the same for hours later. So it gives you a lot of time to work. Now, uh, uh, but I, 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 I want to interrupt well, you here, and, and I know I, I, mm -hmm. uh, be, before you go on, you, you know, there's, <laughs> there's something completely different about your plein air work than anybody on Earth. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a tendency among painters right now to there's a lot of sameness there's a, there's a lot of people who are teaching and a lot of techniques that are coming out you know so that you 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 look at a painting and, it, and they they look the same in terms of execution style there's something different about yours it, is that about this this process because a lot of them start with big shapes but you're catching something differently and i'm not sure how to how to articulate what it is well, it is the big shapes are the most do predominant and essential part, uh, and, and yet they're a lot more meaningful with, you know, complementary detail that support them. Um, I'd say um, my technique is probably, it's probably really informed by uh, all these countless numbers of still lifes and interior subjects that I've painted in my life. And uh, I use a lot of that same painting technique uh, out on location to paint buildings. You know, for one thing, if, uh, for one thing, uh, just a really elementary, uh, incredibly important part that you should learn in, you know, on day one of art class is, is uh, how to really use linear perspective. And, and yet, um, there are lots of artists who have been painting all their lives and still mess it up. But the rules of linear perspective are really self-explanatory, but oftentimes to make it work in a painting is, is deceivingly, deceptively, uh, you know, more complicated than it might appear. Um, especially when you're talking about two point perspective. Uh, one point perspective is, you know, that's pretty straightforward because that one point is going to be on your painting, probably pretty close to the center of your painting. And uh, there's not a thing wrong with doing that. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, in fact, uh, Vermeer did. Uh, uh, virtually all of his paintings are one point perspective. So, you know, there's... there's it's not a, a judgment, but just uh, many times, you know, the subject you take on is going to require two point. Right. It, you know, just depends on the, your angle of, uh, you know, of what you're wanting to compose and so forth. All right. So you you um, you get the award because you're mm -hmm. the first person in the history of the Plein Air podcast to ever bring up perspective. Um. So. I, I think that you we have to assume that there's a lot of people who are listening to this that don't know what the heck you're talking about um, because you know we have a lot of a lot of new painters who who tune in so 
uh, is there a way that I, I know you can't do it visually, but is there a way you can articulate it a little bit um, in terms of how you approach a two point perspective? You're, you're first off, you're establishing your horizon line and then what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Yes. The horizon line is, is the first thing you do. And then, uh, Many times, like if I'm working on painting out on location that requires two-point perspective, I just have to guess at it because you can't set, you know, most times you can't uh, set up, you know, a nail and a string and so forth to, you know, snap, make snap lines or whatever you're doing. Um, but sometimes you actually can, or you can set up one of them. Like uh, I'll bring a, say, if I'm working on a small painting, like an eight by 10, uh, I'll bring a big piece of cardboard with me that, you know, quite a bit bigger than the painting and uh, might be able to set the two point perspective on, on those, you know, uh, on a her extended horizon line that goes, you know, far beyond the boundaries of, of the picture plane. And I uh, put, say, little lightweight C clamps on them to support my uh, mall stick. And uh, if if they're close enough in, that will work fine. And if they're too far for that, then I just really have to guess at them. Or uh, sometimes I'll even uh, bring, you know, a bunch of little C clamps and uh, items with me, just in, you know, things that you wouldn't expect to need string, you know, things with me, uh, on location. And, uh, if possible, like maybe I can tie a string to a tree, uh, nearby where I'm painting and, uh, you know, pull a, uh, you know, uh, put that nail, put a nail at the elevation of the horizon line and then pull a string and make it, make that work out. It, it's, uh, uh, you know, just try to solve problems in whatever practical way you can on location. And, you know, if you just can't, then you, you build skill at estimating where, you know, what the slope of a line should be in relation to the other lines. And you can get pretty good at that. And then also uh, what I've done lots of times is that uh, I'll estimate them out on location and then I'll get in the studio and then set up a string or a stick you know, and then be able to mechanically correct them when where they're off. So I'll, I'll do that quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Come back in the studio, and correct them. Mm-hmm. You know, just real. You know, be out on location, knowing that they're close, but they're not exactly right. Right. So correct. You can you can correct them later. So there there are painters who would say, well, a plein air painting is has to be executed entirely on location. Don't touch it when you get back. What do you say to that? Well, I say I ask, what is your goal? Right. Is your goal to to be a hero, or is your goal to do a good painting? You know, to be some self satisfied purist martyr, <laughs> not to <laughs> inflict any judgment. <laughs> But I, I think um, uh, the only goal is to do your best work. I, I don't see what else matters. It certainly doesn't matter to the viewers because they're not even going to know. And after you're dead and gone and not around to explain and exemplify your virtues, and uh, 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 then uh, nobody's really going to care if you continued working on it after you got back to the studio. But what they are going to remember is the quality of your painting. That's it. That's it. And uh, in fact, this this is an original to me. I think I think a friend of a friend of a friend heard it from the artist Daniel Green. It's it's I think it it goes something like this. You're uh, you're. Don't worry too much. You're, you're only really remembered for your best work. And and your not best work is pretty much forgotten. And uh, I, I think I, I find that a little bit consoling, considering that uh, humans, as humans, we have such a negative bias, that uh, a natural negative bias that comes from evolution and survival, that we... Uh, um, 
that that's one reassuring thing is that you know essentially just like in say in music a one hit wonder well they're remembered for that one good song sure and, and nobody Pie. even know that kind of thing yeah. and and yeah and their other songs aren't even known right so uh even if the artists work just as hard on those uh so I, I actually i take some consolation in that i think it's it's a uh, um, but uh, but uh, an art, artist should strive for a, you know a level of quality and keep things as good as possible and don't let anything out the door if it's really um, not up to a certain standard. So I uh, have a lot of pieces that never go out the door. Uh, and and does, that either, does that happen for you as well? Absolutely. Yeah, they're, they're just pieces that meet a dead end. And uh, usually uh, I've worked longer and harder on those than the good ones. And it, it it just happens that way. It's just part of being human. I don't think I'm the only one that has that. I've, I've heard it from other people that, you know, some of their best projects, whether they're engineers or authors or whatever you do, some of their best projects actually went fairly easily and uh, and didn't have to redo any of it. And their lesser ones they had to redo over and over and over. And I, actually, I, I I find that some that happens with me. But um, I seldom give up on a piece. I'll fight it to the bitter end, uh, and because uh, I just hate to lose. And I uh, I want to do anything to get it right because I just I have this. Um, this uh, tendency to think that uh, it, it, every problem has a solution hidden somewhere. But then there's also uh, the, the old sunk cost right. <laughs> theory of, of human behavior. And so I don't know which is which. <laughs> but I'm, I, I, I realize I'm I, easily pray to that. So I'd like to go into a couple specifics if we could. Um, I, everybody likes to learn some technique or some ideas on technique. Um, talk to me about creating the illusion of light. You know, I, I'm looking at your website at a painting called North Denver. Your website, by the way, is danielsprick.com. And this is an image of, of three houses in it. Looks like a kind of a crummy neighborhood. And the the light is just about as brilliant as I've seen on a painting. And uh, yet it doesn't look it doesn't look like thick impasto, but maybe it is. What 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 is uh, what is it for you that that creates that sense of light? How do you do it? Well. Um, it's, you know, um, first of all, I appreciate the compliments in there. The, um, uh, it, it, it light really only makes sense. Uh, it's the, you know, the shadows around it that make, make sense of it. You know, since we're stuck with our dualistic natures, we can only understand light with its, with its shadows. Right. And, um, what what I come back to uh, all the time is uh, well I mentioned earlier geometric forms and the way light falls on objects and you know and Leonardo did huge you know kind of uh, uh, number of drawings on on the subject of way light hits objects and studied it exhaustively it uh, you know and the, the light is brightest where where the the surface of the object is perpendicular to the light source. And it, you know, it as the object rolls away from the light source, it, it tapers off. And those who, you know, that's what you should learn, you know, on day two of Art 101. And whenever I'm instructing, I, I, no matter what the subject is, I, I make everyone suffer through, um, uh, you know, drawings of spheres, you know, uh, you know, primary light, you know, highlight, 
form shadow, cast shadow, reflected light, core shadow, and get all that down and uh, uh, with with a spear, a cone, cube, um, uh, those subjects. And I know it's it's too obvious that and linear perspectives. They're too easy and obvious for people, and they don't want to do it. But in fact, it, it's endlessly important for understanding how to, uh, you know, generate a strong illusion of light falling on an object. It, it's, it can't, you just can't even overestimate the importance of it. And, and it, it really, when you have that down, uh, just you practice it so much that it just becomes second nature, you know, with your, you know, neurological wiring that you, you just, um, it, it makes it easier for you to paint the light on the side of a house or, or um, you know, whether it's a direct shaft of sunlight or if it's a, a real soft overcast light, uh, you, you just, you kind of already have it instinctively. And, and that is a result of practice and, and, and of thinking about it constantly when that UPS driver knocks on your door Instead of listening to what he's talking about, you're, you're probably looking at the shadow under his nose. It's it just that it, 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 and missed the whole point and, and miss what might have been an important message. But you, you just get pre, preoccupied and it, it's, it, it takes over your life. And that's how you make it work. It takes over your life, but you're a pretty willing slave. That was such a perfect Daniel Sprick moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so one of the things I'd like you to do is to tell the story of the horse. There was a documentary that was produced about you by PBS in Denver, which uh, we showed at the Figurative Art Convention when you were there and spoke. And uh, but there's the story of the horse, and I I think it. I think it's fascinating because it says something about your personality. Will you be willing to share that? Oh, sure, I will. I will. But I have to say that documentary makes it seem like it was one of the, you know, turning points of my life, which really isn't. It's just a, a one thing that I've done. <laughs> but, um, well, I'll tell you the story. Is that um, there's a... Uh, uh, there were drawings done by the English artist George Stubbs in about 1780 or so, r- roughly around that time, uh, about the time of the American Revolution, I'd say, roughly in that period. Uh, um, but he was over in England, and he was, uh, you know, an artist of, of horses. Uh, I mean, primarily horses, but other animals, too and hunting scenes and, you know, other wildlife that primarily circled around horses. And he did these dissections of a horse and he um, reduced a horse down to a skeleton and did these extraordinary drawings of it that, you know, 250 years ago that are just really remarkable drawings. And I saw those uh, uh, reproduced in a book uh, for the first time when I was about 20 years old and I just it, Slipped. And I wanted to be an artist, and I, I, I did careful copies of those drawings, and uh, I never really forgot about it. And I read the story of how he did the dirty work of cleaning up the horse himself. And uh, so, uh, many years later, well, about ten years later, I was uh, on a hike in the woods, and there was the uh, body of a fairly freshly dead horse. And, uh, you know, the light went off and I, uh, without going into the gory details, I, uh, I, uh, you know, I packed the thing home in my truck and cleaned it up, which took weeks. And it was, you know, not the most pleasant of jobs, uh, you know, with flies buzzing around and the stench, but I, I, I knew there was a pony in there somewhere. <laughs> uh, and, and then I, I, uh, I think the, the job was just so, so, you know, tedious and unfun. And I, I think I kind of burned out on it and just 
uh, after, because it took weeks to do it. And then uh, eventually I just put, I just put all those bones away and I didn't even touch them for the next, gosh, it was like 20, 20 or 30 years later when, um, uh, and I was very close to throwing them out, if, you know, whenever it would move, you know, how you throw things away when you move. And, uh, but they survived several moves and uh, I still had them. And then, um, I got the idea. Oh, well, I, I, um, there was a, a commission. Uh, I, I was honored to receive a commission to paint the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I said, oh, okay, now I've got my horse. So I, I uh, took it upon myself to uh, uh, rebuild, you know, put the puzzle together, basically. That's what it is. And I relied on the drawings of George Tubbs as a guide because they really, he did get it right. And, um, you know, as far as the skeletal anatomy goes. And it took about a month. And, uh, you know, the hard part for me to figure out was uh, just how to make an armature, you know, without being able to uh, weld parts together, which would have been nice. Um, but you've got to have, you know, welding equipment and everything. Uh, what I did was I'd go to the Museum of Natural History and just look at how they built their armatures figure out how I could build one uh, just, you know, with pipes and cables and things like that. And then the rest of it just, it goes together like a puzzle and uh, the parts will only fit together one way. And so, it, you know, a lot of ways you can't really get it wrong, but it does take a long time to sort them out. Uh, what I found out later was that people who do this kind of work don't let all these small bones get mixed together in a bucket because it's pretty darn hard to, you know, you know, get all four feet, you know, the small bones are the difficult and to, to get those, uh, you know, in the right place is, you know, it's, it's really hard to sort them out, but it can be done just, just like a puzzle. So let's let's move back to plein air painting because uh, we're going to have you on stage at the plein air convention. You're going to be on the main stage, um, along with some others. But you're there. You're you're on stage by yourself. W what are you going to try to demonstrate when you're up there? What what principles? Well, the things I've talked about, you know, geometric principles of, you know, of how light falls on an object. I mean to say. I mean to say principles of how light falls on a geometric object and how to translate that to uh, the things that we see and translate that to organic shapes. But um, also this, what I'm going to try to do, what I have in mind um, is to, is just to try to paint a scene inside the room. Since it is, and I have nothing against working from photographs and I do a fair amount of it. But I want to just paint something just impromptu on the spot, just an interior of the room that we're working in. And the principles will apply. I don't know. What do you think of that? I think whatever, what, uh, whatever you want to do, you get to do. Well, I'm, I, I, I want to try it. Maybe put a few figures in there. It, you know, the thing of it is, I, I, I could be working for hours after people have fallen asleep. And, and being carted <laughs> off on in ambulances from, you know, <laughs> starvation and thirst and things like that. But uh, it, it, uh, the problem is that it really, it can really take a long time. When I'm painting on location, a lot of times I'll, I'll be there for a good five hours to do a little eight by 10. Um, and even that, it seems like the time goes by so fast and the, the light is completely changed unless you're lucky and had an overcast day. And that makes life a lot easier for painting. No doubt about it. Um, but I, I'd like to, I paint scenes with, you know, crowds of people in them sometimes and not single one single person's holding still. And so what you end up doing is making a come, you know, say you're working on one figure, you may make a composite of numerous different figures. 
Well, one of my like one it. of my favorite paintings is uh, I have up on the screen here a photo I took of it is the um, the painting you did at the plein air convention in San Francisco and you had uh, it's a painting of the painters lined up painting a scene which I love because I love paintings paintings of plein air painters but what I found amazing even though there's not a lot of detail uh, you know you don't you, you're just kind of indicating detail. What's amazing to me is how you change the light on a figure. It's much different than what I'm I'm used to seeing. You know, there is that still <clears throat> that gradual gradation on the light falling on those figures. Oh, oh thanks. Now I have to look at it again. I, I, I want to look at it. The, um, as I recall, I think what happened there, what made it a little easier for, for me, was looking way across the bay. The other shore, opposite shore, was had sunlight on it, so that yeah. was nice and bright. And the shore that I, I was standing on with the other painters was in shadow of the clouds. And so it, it just it kind of was a, a nice setup right there. And I saw the people in front of me on um, kind of stretched out in this horizontal tableau, which I I just thought, oh, that is so great. And it made me think of. Uh, uh, a painting by Thomas, two paintings by Thomas Aikens. One is Mending the Nets, where you see the, the figures, they're small and at a distance, kind of on your horizon. And and there's another uh, another painting by him called Shooting for Rail. Rail being a type of uh, hapless little bird that gets shot at. And... Um, it, the, the, the way he has those figures out across, you know, at a distance, in a horizontal distribution. And I saw all the artists just like that. And I said, oh, man, this is perfect. i got to do it. So uh, here's what I like about painting on location is you go somewhere to paint. You may have thought, you, I thought I was going to paint the bridge. Cause, you know, I love to, but then I saw something else that was just too irresistible, but, you know, a better idea. So I'm always willing to uh, uh, discard my uh, intended purpose if, you know, if a better idea presents itself. Well, that's, a, that, you know, that's a, a, a pretty interesting approach, too, because I think that uh, the temptation is when you're standing in a place looking at, a, at an iconic thing like the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, you you're showing, basically, your painting is showing everybody looking towards the Golden Gate Bridge. They're all painting it. And you've, you've chosen something different. And, and I think sometimes the temptation of an iconic scene is so strong that it's, it's kind of hard to resist. So I applaud you for doing that. Well, thanks. Thanks. Well, I, I've thought about this lots of times. Say, like, you travel to, you know, paint a, an exquisite cathedral somewhere in Europe and you've been planning on it for a long time, you really want to do it, but you get there, and you just, you know, it looks fine, it's what you expected, but you, you look safe behind yourself, and the, the light on a, you know, really nondescript object is uh, exquisite, and, and the composition is kind of really powerful, and you, I think my feeling is uh, I'll turn around and paint the nondescript subject if it's going to be a better painting. That's the the only goal of it is to get the best piece I can. So if I could get a really good painting of a you know gas station or something uninteresting, rather than um, a mediocre painting of of the Chartres Cathedral, then let me just try to get the best painting. So, so talk to me about, uh, talk to me about um, if, if you were training people today, and I don't, I don't know, are you doing that? Are you doing any workshops or anything? I just do for friends yeah. that, that show, show up at the studio one right. at a time. Well, there's going to be a lot of people showing up at your studio now. Be careful. Oh. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, um, uh, if, if you were uh, kind of meeting somebody for the very first time and they said, uh, I'm just going to start this plein air painting thing, what advice would you give to them? I would say don't start out with plein air painting. 
I, I get a lot. Yeah, it's just, you know what, because it's going to be frustrating. And um, I want people to succeed. And so uh, you're, I think you're more likely to succeed if you're prepared. And, and uh, you get a lot of preparation by starting out just getting used to handling oil paint and, or, or pastel or watercolor or charcoal, whatever it is you like to use. And, and, and really get pretty good at it. Uh, you know, get it, or you don't have to be great, but get, get some experience with it. So you kind of know how, how to, you know, what to expect with the, just material handling. Because when you get out on location, there's like, uh, it, it's just, it's logistically a lot more difficult. And, and uh, you probably arrived there and you've forgotten something that you needed, or you've, um, you know, the wind is blowing or it's burning hot or getting eaten up by bugs. <laughs> There's a lot of things. And, but even more importantly than that, even if the conditions are all perfect, you're just looking at something that's incomprehensibly uh, difficult and complex. And I just think you need to start with simpler objects and uh, say, like, you know, get good at painting oranges on a plate in a real controlled light uh, you know, any kind of subject that might appeal to you, flowers. Flowers are very complex. But I, 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 so I, w- I, would, I would shift to things like, you know, spheres and cones and uh, pyramids and, and, you know, cubes and little things like that and really understand how the light falls on them. Uh, I've had several, I've had to, several people uh, that I've known who have taken up art classes and they go into an art class, and the first thing they're doing is painting spears and cones and squares and so on. And it's frustrating to them. It's kind of like learning the piano without learning a song. It's like immediately going to, uh, to the scales. Uh, so what, what's the, is, is there a compromise in terms of doing something? These people obviously need to learn these things, but is there something that will help keep them enthusiastic and interested so they don't drop out too soon. You know, that's true, and it's very important. I'm glad you mentioned that. It, it, because uh, it seems like you're just, you know, if you're, you're just doing scales, it, it's like you're jumping through hoops and, uh, for no reason. And you, you certainly have to understand the reason and how it's going to really be applicable to more interesting things. But uh, what I've generally been able to do, not with everybody, but with some people, is to, to make those spheres and cubes interesting. And uh, if you can do, or say, a cone, if you can do a cone really, really well, you'll find that you're pretty happy with it, and you find it more rewarding than you might have expected. And um, and then, and, and I'd uh, okay, a, a direct answer to the question is that, say, you're painting on a cone, and then just look at the arm of a model and, and see, see how, show the person how many cylinders and uh, conical shapes there are embedded in that form. And, you know, on the overall form and then, you know, on, you know, surface elements of it and, and how that uh, you're going to be able to go from painting a you know, a cone and a, a cylinder to painting a, 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 the arm of a model, just for example. I, I it, think, I think what gets, you're saying here, it, and, and might be a really good, uh, good thing for everybody who's teaching, is to, be, rather than just setting up and saying, okay, we're gonna, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to draw or paint cones and squares or whatever, is to show them examples of how this is going to benefit them early on so for instance showing some slides and and uh, show a model and then say okay now here point out the cone in in this or the cylinder in this or the the cube in this particular shape then maybe then the light goes off and they go ah now i get it now this will help me uh as i go further down the road that's really true it's really important and and as a matter of fact i think you know, when you look back at your own education, elementary school and throughout and 
high school history classes. You know, it, it, as a student at any age, if you don't see the purpose of it, you just you think you're just jumping through hoops to please somebody, and it's uh, not satisfying. And and it, you're not going to learn anything if you don't understand the purpose. So I think what you said is really important. And and uh, you know probably uh, at least half of the people who attend conventions are uh, uh, do a lot of instructing too. And so a, a lot of this is really I think helpful for both learning and for instructing and, and learning and instructing are two sides of the same thing. You're, uh, and as you instruct, you deepen your own knowledge. Well, it's, it, it's this, really, whole, this whole idea of encouragement is so critical. Uh, you, you know, there's a time to be tough clearly, uh, but there's also a time to be encouraging I, because I've probably met more people who've dropped out of painting than have taken up painting because they they don't have any confidence when they first start and there's this belief uh that there is natural inborn talent uh that i I mean some people do have that there's no question about that but that that there's this belief that if you don't have that you can't succeed and 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 have a happy life as a as a drawer painter artist or whatever Well, um, it's true. There's there's misconceptions that need to be corrected about what it is, and I, um, it's I really try hard to set people up for success because I know exactly you're exactly right that, uh, that most people don't stick with it because it just seems too frustrating. But there there is a way to to get around it, I, to, to um, you know, improve the chances of success. And one of which is, you know, it's setting people up with exercises while very clearly uh, uh, showing how this is going to benefit later, for, you know, in future uh, problem solving. Yeah. I, 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 I kind of disagree with what you said about, uh, people being born with natural ability. I just, I don't even think it exists. All of art, music, literature, everything, it's learned behavior. I mean, we may have natural dispositions. And as for me, it was a whole lot better to go into, um, 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 you know, art or something visual uh, than to, uh, say, try to be a professional basketball player. I'd never succeed at that. I'm just not any good at that. And so, uh, 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 you know, yes, you you need to pick something that's, uh, you know, that aligns with your strengths as an individual. And so some people are going to have better success in art than others, probably based on, uh, you know, heritable characteristics. But even, say, you take a basketball player, the most talented basketball player in the world, well, it took, it took this natural coordination and, and then practiced 12 hours a day, every day, and then they became a good basketball player. I think that, you know, there's, you know, stories and legends and myths about, you know, Mozart, the most natural genius in the world, say. Well, if he hadn't been born into a family of musicians, you know, in a pretty demanding and encouraging um, instructor father, we, there would be no Mozart. Right, right. He's born into it. He's born into it. Add that to natural proclivity and enthusiasm. Well, and I, and see... I would think his... Go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, 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 what does he say about in, in, instructing? Uh, you know, whether it's a musician's father instructing or whether it's you know, it's you instructing your students. I, um, half, the, half of it is the technical stuff, information, you know, how light falls on objects, how to draw linear perspective. The other half of it is morale building. I think it's every bit as important, you know, and, and uh, showing people how they can succeed uh, is, is every bit 
are even more important than, than uh, you know, the technical information. Well, I have, I, you know, I have the experience of raising kids, and, and you do as well. And I, I noticed that, you know, we, we're pretty lackadaisical with our kids in some respects. We kind of want them to be kids and, and grow up and, and enjoy themselves. And yet there are other kids whose parents have driven them. You know, you got to piano recitals every week and, and piano practice five days a week and, and, and on the weekends and constantly. And, you know, a lot of these kids complain about it and then you know 10 years later they're happy their parents did it for them so there's there's kind of that um the 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 importance of of somebody driving you i guess if you're if you're young uh then there's the there's the other part about that is self-motivation a lot of people are coming into art at different stages of their lives i i counted i think 30 or 40 doctors that i met who were still practicing surgeons and other things that, that came to the plein air convention and uh you know they're they're taking up art they're interested in art and they're they're starting at you know 50 years old or 40 years old or 60 years old and so they've got to be self-motivated and and the you know we have to find ways to get some of those some of these people are never going to give up because their personalities others give up too quickly because it seems too hard I don't know how we overcome that. Just by, you know, breaking each problem down into component parts, which geometric objects are, uh, and, uh, and, and showing how you, you don't have to, and in fact, you can't solve it all at once. You solve it down into little pieces. And, you know, doctors definitely can understand that because they didn't learn medicine in one day. They, they, they learned, you know, very small parts of it over many years. And, and you just kind of explain that it. it's going to be a lot like that with art. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, and uh, which, by the way, those, those are people I, uh, I think I love to help them most is that uh, I'm, I'm just astounded that somebody would go, you know, has a good, well-paying career. I mean, accomplishment and recognition for their work and all kinds of things. Why on earth do they want to beat themselves up to be an artist? I, I, but it amazes me. And, and I think that answers in itself is that, that um, there's just no substitute for something done by hand. Uh, you, know, you know, whether it's, you know, you, you know, material crafting or playing a musical instrument or, or painting a, Paying a picture, um, uh, there, it's just it, it's just fundamentally satisfying for humans in some ways that intellectual accomplishments may not be. Yeah, uh, well, and well, Dan, I hear that from people. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we're we're kind of running out of time here. We're running down the clock, and so I apologize. But uh, I think I think we we probably need to. We need to wrap this up. Any, any final thoughts um, for everybody uh, before we roll? Uh, <laughs> well, let's see. I'd like to say keep encouraged. But I, 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 I'd like more to show you how to keep encouraged. Uh, and, um, and, and there's other things, too. Is that we're, we're never going to be perfect at this. And, and what we have to do is learn how to be, um, take some satisfaction in what we can do and not get too beat up about what we can't do. We're too, we, you know, because everyone has limitations. It doesn't matter who the artist is. There, there, are, there are certain limitations of what you can do, and you have to so, somehow forgive yourself for not being perfect. And, and uh, because until you're perfect, your art won't be. And we'll never be perfect. It's always going to be, uh, you know, have problems. And we just, we have to kind of uh, back off of our uh, pursuit of perfection a little bit and, uh, and take some enjoyment from it. Good thoughts. Dan, thank you for being on the Plein Air podcast. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on. Well, thanks again to Dan Sprick. Uh, Dan is absolutely amazing. What an incredible painter, and I feel fortunate to know him. Are you guys ready for some marketing ideas? 
This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art, proven techniques to turn your passion into profit. In the Marketing Minute, I try to answer art marketing questions from you. You can email your questions to me, eric at artmarketing.com. By the way, there's a lot of content at artmarketing.com, a lot of ideas for you. So here, uh, this listener said he'd like to be anonymous. I assume it's a he, but I actually, I, I know it's a he because I, I saw his email. And he says, uh, my art is in a new gallery, but the gallery owner is focused on creating her own art. And as far as I can tell, isn't focusing on marketing the gallery. There are no Facebook campaigns, no ads, no email campaigns. There's nothing going on. And all the people coming into the gallery are the owner's friends and artists. I'm not seeing a lot of activity. So the first part of my two-part question is, how do I advise and help this gallery owner reach out to the local market and help educate them about buying local landscape paintings uh, and what main steps should she take? I don't know if the gallery has other than landscape paintings, but the answer is going to be the same no matter what. And that is, first off, uh, you gotta you gotta learn marketing, and and I can help her with that. You can point her to some of my marketing stuff, but I even have a blog for galleries. But I don't want to be negative, so forgive this. But if you own a business, any kind of a business, but especially in this case an art gallery, it cannot be a hobby, or it will fail unless you're independently wealthy. On the other hand, a gallery that knows how to promote and advertising is more likely to succeed. Now, my gallery works very hard for its artist and for itself. It's always getting local stories in the newspaper, on local websites. It's always advertising. It's doing direct mail on social media. They're really working it. They sell a lot of art. As a matter of fact, I sent a piece in, uh, and two weeks later, it was gone. They sold it. One of the reasons I selected this gallery is because they're aggressive. The worst thing is the gallery that does nothing and hopes people will walk in and buy something. But that's kind of the old days. It doesn't work that way very much anymore. So yeah, there are gallery owners out there that have people walk in, and, uh, but the traffic is typically not enough. So one gallery I, I know, one owner I know, actually makes calls all week long to potential and, and, and previous buyers. You have to work it. Gallery owners have to work hard. That's why I say, if you're in a gallery and you're in a good one, they're earning their money. Don't be so worried about paying them their commission. They're earning it. You know, you don't want to be the one that's on the phone all day trying to drum up business, do you? Chances are, if the gallery owner is serious, she would be doing all these things now. Now, maybe she needs to learn them, and maybe you can offer help and suggest that uh, she do some things, but the way I would approach it is say, hey, I've noticed I'm not seeing a lot of marketing and so on. Would you be willing to let me help you with that? Or would you be willing to let me give you some ideas? If she or he says no, then move on. Uh, You will spend a lot of time frustrated that they're not working for you if your paintings are in that gallery. So in that case, if you don't believe they're going to work it, move on because it's not going to do you any good. Paintings are going to sit on the wall and not move. You don't want that. You want a gallery that paintings are moving off the wall all the time or as much as possible. So this goes to the point about selecting a gallery. We artists think it's up to them to select us, and to some extent it is because you want to be invited in. I have a whole strategy on that in one of my videos, but I tell artists to develop their wish list of galleries that they want to be in, and I give them very specific information on how to promote yourself ethically and appropriately to them. But in your target list, you've got to do your homework. Is the gallery advertising, and are they doing it frequently? Are they sending out invitations to shows? You should get on their list. You should get on their email list and find out. Are they doing a lot of shows? Do they generate publicity? Are they properly working social media? And I say properly because most social media strategies are flawed and most of the things that people think they're doing a social media strategy, it's not working for them and they can't tell. They can't see because they assume everything they post is getting out there. The reality is only 2% now, 2% of everything you post. Let's say you have 5,000 people on your Facebook and you post, you're assuming all 5,000 people see it. No. 2% see it. It's not always the same 2%, but usually these days they're repeating a lot of the same 2%. So there's strategies around that. But 
The social media advertising can be effective if it's done right, but it's just not a matter of pressing boost post. It's not a matter of doing what everybody else is doing. There's a whole new realm of technological developments and new ways of making social media work. We're, we're doing a lot of it, and we're using some experts to help us with that. Most people don't know about those kinds of things. But when interviewing an, a gallery, ask them about their process. How do they sell? Who does the selling? How do they present their work to buyers? What happens when somebody walks into the gallery? How do they get visitors? How much is sold online? How much selling do they do via the phone? And how often are they selling artwork? If they say, well, we're selling one or two pieces a month, you have to ask, well, how are they paying the rent? Well, if they're expensive pieces, they can pay the rent. But if they're inexpensive pieces, they're eventually going to be out of business. And you want to hang with winners. You know, you could be friends with people, and I have a lot of friends that are not necessarily successful at what they do. They're still friends, and I love them, but I'm not going to put my career in their hands. I'm going to put my career in my own hands and in the hands of people who are going to succeed, and that's what you want to do, so do your homework. Your second question says, I find that many art lovers who attend art galleries and festivals are art voyeurs who visit as a form of entertainment instead of for the purpose of purchasing art. How do we educate this fan segment and convert them to buyers? Well, I think your term art voyeurs is interesting. You know, I used to be an art voyeur. I, I would go to art shows because I liked art. And once in a while, I'd buy a piece. I never, ever went intending to buy a piece. And I don't think most people go intending to buy a piece. They go to see things to see what they like. And if they see something they like, they might buy it. I have been literally to hundreds of of art openings. And I can tell you that a good gallery can convert what you call art voyeurs into art buyers. And a poor gallery doesn't know how to do it. And I think it's about the gallery and their sales process, the training they give their people and how they engage people. Clearly, you start by inviting past buyers, known buyers, people who have spent money in the past because you want them there spending money again. Second, you target people who have money. And you can find people through various lists. You can advertise in targeted places, affluent magazines. For instance, my magazine, if you're thinking a national strategy, my magazine, Fine Art Connoisseur, is the most affluent art collector magazine in existence. It's got billionaires and multimillionaires. And though it doesn't have tons and tons of them, it's got probably three, 400 billionaires and 1,000 multimillionaires. How many do you need to buy a painting, really? I have one... Uh, one gallery tells me every time he advertises, he sells an average of $80,000 worth of artwork because he's selling pieces that are expensive. Now, that doesn't work for everybody, but there are places that you can go for affluent people. And so you want a gallery that's working every show. All their salespeople are there working. They're engaging customers appropriately, asking them questions, engaging them about art, and they gently nudge someone into a decision. Now, other galleries I know are not working it. They sit and they drink with their customers. They socialize. They're having a good time. But they're not doing any selling. They're just hanging out with people. And you need to do some selling. That doesn't mean you have to be inappropriate or nudge people too hard or be obnoxious. There's very appropriate ways to do it. Happens all the time. And, and if you go to a good gallery and you observe how they do it, you'll see that these people are pros and they know how to do it. So don't do it the wrong way. Don't be pushy or obnoxious. Everybody, though, needs a little bit of a nudge. You know, sometimes they just need to be kind of help realize that they love it and they want to take it home. Chances are these art voyeurs, you call, are coming to the gallery that you described. And chances are they're probably not serious about buying but they can get nudged into it. The gallery that you described doesn't sound like they're serious about selling. So they're going to be serious about it when they can't pay the rent, but by then it's too late, of course, because you know when you're, once you're out of money, you're out of money, and it's hard to fix that. So you've got to be proactive and get ahead of this. So it's important for everybody, whether you're an artist, whether you're a gallery, whether you have a business, it's important to understand the principles of selling and marketing. Selling and marketing can make the difference. I was in a meeting today, and we were talking about a strategy 
that would make certain things that we do even bigger and it's all always about selling and marketing. So keep that in mind. I hope this is helpful. This has been the Marketing Minute. This has been the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes. You can learn more at artmarketing.com. A reminder that it's your last chance to enter the Plein Air Salon to win the 15,000 in prizes. The awards will be presented at the Plein Air Convention on stage, so get your best paintings of the year in. Studio paintings, still life, figure, portrait, plein air, landscape, there's all kinds of categories, 20 different categories, including student categories and so on. Visit pleinairsalon.com before March 15th at midnight. If you're listening to this after the fact, enter the next one because there's uh, next year is going to be even bigger. We have more cash prizes and some big announcements about next year. If you've not seen my blog where I talk about life and art and lots of other things, I think it's up to about a quarter million readers now. It's called Sunday Coffee and you can find it and subscribe for free, coffeewitheric.com and all of them are posted there but if you hit the subscribe button then they'll come to you every Sunday morning. It's fun doing this. I love it. We'll do it again sometime like next week. I'm going to get some sleep. I'm exhausted from Russia, but we'll see you next week. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine. And remember, it's a big world out there. I just experienced that, and I just painted it. You need to get out there and paint it, too. We'll see you. Bye-bye. This has been the Plein Air Podcast with Plein Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about Plein Air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at pleinairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook. 240 plein air painting tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at pleinairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening.